problems. So it's my pleasure to introduce Charlene Santana. She's coming all the way from Seattle to give us this talk. Um, Charlene and I overlapped for a few years when I was in Seattle, and she was always just doing really fascinating work, playing with really cool toys, the research tools, sorry. Um, and I thought she'd be a really engaging speaker to have come and talk to all of us. So Charlene did her undergraduate work in Venezuela, and her PhD at University of Ma UM, UMass Amherst, and a postdoc at UCLA in the Center for Society and Genomics, which sounds super interesting, and then joined University of Washington. So really excited to hear about your work. Turn this on. Can people hear me okay with the microphone? Sort of? It needs to be higher, huh? Okay. How about now? Is that better? Yeah? Okay, great. So there are three screens. So I'm going to focus on the middle one <laughs> to point at things. Uh, and I, they told me there is feedback, so I'm going to try to avoid areas of feedback here. Okay, so I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much, guys, for the invitation. I've had a wonderful day so far talking with everybody, and I'm really looking forward to meeting and talking with many more of you. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that we're developing in my lab where we're mapping the evolution of cranial morphology in bats. And this is part of a larger project where we're comparing the evolution of cranial morphology of bats with uh, other groups like carnivorans and primates. So let's start by looking at this. Uh, my pointer works. Oh, here you go. Uh, this bat skull. So this is the skull of a free-tailed bat. And just like the skull of all vertebrates, it is a multifunctional structure. It protects the brain, it provides support for the sensory organs, and it enables feeding. So when we look at this skull, because all of these functions have really uh, strong importance for the survival of this bat, um, hmm. can we fix the screen? <laughs> I'll keep talking. Um, because all these functions are really important for the survival of bats and other vertebrates, then um, what we're going to see is that that morphology has been shaped uh, by selection on the performance of all these functions. So we're looking at the, at the joint effect of all these in the evolution of morphology. Okay, but it's back. Okay, so in my lab we're very interested in, in understanding uh, how these different selective pressures have shaped uh, the differences in morphology in mammals, uh, in particular in the skull of mammals. And within mammals we focus particularly on bats, and that is because bats are extremely, an extremely diverse group of mammals. So they are about 20% of all mammals, so one in every four mammals is a bat. And they're also extremely diverse in terms of their ecologies. So within bats, uh, even if you just look at uh, their dietary diversity, you can find basically every diet that has evolved, almost every diet that has evolved in mammals as a whole, as well as some derived uh, dietary strategies. So you have insect eating bats, fruit eating bats, nectar eating bats, bats that eat vertebrates, and some species that eat even blood. And associated with this huge dietary diversity, there is also a ton of behavioral diversity and also morphological diversity of their skulls. So if we look at a small sample of bats, uh, bat skulls, you will see that there is a lot of variation just within this very small sample and then the shape uh, of the skulls. And there's also a lot of variation in size, but that's something that I'm not going to touch too much upon, but we can talk about later. OK, so the way that we uh, investigate uh, the evolution of cranial morphology in bats uh, is centered around uh, the field of ecomorphology. So this is an integrated field where we look at how variation in morphological traits um, as animals perform an ecological task, such as feeding, um, results in differences in performance. Uh, but morphologies do not uh, act uh, alone. They need to be used through behaviors. So we also see, uh, look at how variation in different behaviors uh, might allow different species with different morphologies to generate different performance characteristics. And then ultimately, 
uh, this variation is uh, connected to fitness or differential survival, reproduction, or growth of individuals, although admittedly uh, for the study of bats, this is something that we're not able to measure because they are very long-lived organisms that reproduce very slowly. So this framework is what we call the ecomorphological paradigm, uh, proposed by Arnold in the 80s, and it's a really nice integrated framework that allows us to then look at how variation in all these parameters uh, may explain things like uh, the use of different ecological resources among different species. For example, if you go to a very uh, highly diverse community, you can look at their differences in morphology, behavior, and performance and see how they might be partitioning ecological resources. And then at a broader scale, we can also look at an evolutionary scale uh, how differences in morphology, performance, and behavior might lead to differences in ecological and species diversification. For example, how the evolution of particular morphological traits might lead to uh, colonizing in different niches and different ecological opportunities. So this is basically what uh, we do in my lab, uh, primarily then with the, the cranial morphology and the feeding apparatus of bats to try to understand their patterns of uh, both uh, taxonomic diversity, uh, phenotypic diversity, and ecological diversity. Let's click here. Okay, there you go. Okay, so what do we know uh, then in terms of the different adaptations of the cranial apparatus of bats? So uh, there are two main things that might be at play when we're thinking about what shapes the diversity of skull morphologies in bats. And as I hinted earlier, uh, that this has to do with this multifunctionality of the skull. Uh, so on one hand, uh, we have several studies that have linked the diversity of uh, cranial morphologies to certain food processing demands in some groups of bats. So there are certain traits that have been quantified and quantitatively linked to the evolution. Uh, the evolution of these traits has been linked uh, to certain dietary demands like uh, food hardness or food size or food type. So these traits include things like uh, the length of the rostrum, so the snout of the bats, the mechanical advantage of the skull or how um, good these morphologies might be in translating muscle force into bite force, the general shape of the skull, the trade-off between bite force and gape, uh, resistant of these uh, different skull bones to the masticatory forces. For example, bats that feed on harder prey items might have uh, greater resistance of those forces in their skulls. Uh, even developmental patterns like the integration within the mandible seem to be associated with certain diets. And also uh, the morphology of the soft tissues, including the muscles that uh, open and close the jaw seem to be varying uh, across species that feed on, on different things in bats. Okay, I'm gonna stand here and just advance the slides with the keyboard because this is not helping. Okay, there you go. Okay, so as I said earlier too, then the skull performs all these other functions uh, and one of them has to do with the senses and bats, in addition to being super diverse in terms of their diets, they're also super diverse in terms of sensory modalities. So within bats, we have species that have lost the ability to echolocate. These are the pteropodids, so the old world fruit and nectar feeding bats. And these bats rely primarily uh, on vision and olfaction to find their prey. Now within this group, we have seen also the evolution again of echolocation, but uh, a type of echolocation that is very different than that of the rest of bats, which is lingual echolocation. So there's a genus of bats, Rosettus, that uses tongue clicks and the echoes from those tongue clicks to navigate their environments. Most of you might be familiar with the fact that bats echolocate, so they use high frequency sounds to navigate their environment and find prey. And within echolocators, uh, we find two major groups. We have oral echolocating bats, and these are bats that are producing sound uh, with their larynx, and the sound is coming out of their mouth, and then they're receiving the echoes, uh, and that gives them information about prey items or their environment. And then we have nasally echolocating bats, and these are bats where they also produce the sound in their larynx, but the sound comes out of their nostrils. And most of these bats, you will see that they have these kind of elaborate uh, soft tissue structures called nose leaves uh, that somehow help direct the sound. And we also have bats that use olfaction, uh, primarily to find plant resources like fruits and flowers. And then we have the vampire bats, which have evolved infrared thermal sensing to find warm-blooded uh, animals that serve as food. <laughs> 
So there is less evidence uh, in terms of how different senses might have shaped the evolution of skull morphology in bats, but there is some indication that that uh, might have also played a role. So there was a study by Scott Peterson in the 90s uh, where he was looking at the degree of uh, rostral flexure uh, with respect to the brain case between oral echolocating bats and nasally echolocating bats. And the degree of rostral flexure tells you a little bit as to uh, how the echolocation cold beam is going to be directed. So what he found was that the nasal emitting bats tend to have snouts that are pointing more downwards. And what that does is that that positions the nostrils um, and therefore the sound emitting structure more in line with the flight path of the bat. Whereas the oral emitting bats uh, tend to have snouts that are more intermediate or turn upward. And this uh, again positions the collocation cold beam in front of the flight direction of the bat, uh, but also it might increase the width of the collocation cold beam, which has some repercussions in terms of the, some of the sound parameters. Now, more recently, with the advent of CT scanning technologies, we're also able to uh, uncover more and more features of the skulls of bats that might be associated with different types of echolocation. For example, some groups of nasal echolocating bats have a ton of variation in their turbinate bones, which are delicate bones that are inside the nasal cavity. And the size and the types and numbers of these bones seem to be associated with different echolocation call parameters. So it's a lot of features also of the skull that might have evolved in tandem with echolocation call parameters or echolocation call type. Okay, so today my plan is to show you some of the results that we have in some of our broad morphological analysis across bats, uh, looking at their skulls. And I'm gonna show you uh, results uh, that will tell you a little bit about how skull morphology has evolved during the broad radiation of bats, and also how these patterns are related to sensory and feeding behavior and ecology. So trying to get a little bit more to that kind of ecomorphological perspective of the evolution of um, cranial morphology in bats. And I need to acknowledge that uh, most of the data that I'm going to present to you today is the product of the very hard work of um, my two uh, postdocs, uh, Dr. Jessica Arbor and Dr. Abigail Curtis, uh, who did a ton of CT scanning and analysis, and I get the privilege to present those results today. Okay, so how do we analyze skull shape across this whole diversity of bats? So doing that is not a trivial task because most bat skulls are really small. Uh, so they're difficult uh, to measure with traditional methods uh, in a very precise fashion. But luckily we live in an era where we have micro CT scanning uh, more and more available. So we use this kind of very fancy X-ray machine to create then uh, digital representations of the skulls of bats, uh, which we can blow up as big as we want in our computer, and we can uh, measure that and use uh, for comparative analysis. So we've been compiling uh, a large data set of bat skulls, uh, which right now spans over 200 bat species with replicates, 50 to 100% generic coverage within families, and about 20% species coverage within bats. And, and the data set that I'm going to present today represents all their diets and sensory modalities. So we have a really powerful data set to test how uh, differences in sensory ecology or diet might have shaped the evolution of skull uh, shaped in bats. Uh, today I'm going to, I'm going to focus uh, on the results on the cranium because that's where this kind of sensory and uh, feeding functions uh, overlap the most. Uh, but feel free to ask me questions about our mandible data set uh, and I can show you a little bit of that too. Okay, so how do I, we analyze skull shape? So once we have our big, uh, CT scan data set, we apply a method that is uh, commonly used in morphometrics, which is called geometric morphometrics. So in case uh, some of you are not familiar with this method, I'm gonna explain it super quickly. Uh, what we do is we take uh, our morphological structure, in this case, the cranium, and we place homologous landmarks uh, or sliding semi-landmarks, so little points uh, around different anatomical features of the cranium. And then we use an uh, analysis called Procostis superimposition. And what this analysis does is that uh, it corrects for differences in size, orientation, position, um, et cetera, uh, of the specimens. Uh, and that leaves us then with a set of uh, Procostis coordinates or shape variables that are, in, for the most part, independent of size differences. Uh, and then we can use those, to, we can use those variables to compare across species. Uh, 
because this is a very highly dimensional data set, as you can imagine, we have many landmarks, we have uh, many specimens and species, uh, we need to use multivariate methods to reduce their dimensionality uh, to then do phylogenetic comparative analysis. So we do that through a principal component analysis, which then gives us um, fewer variables to do than the next set of analysis. Um, so for the results that I'm going to present today, uh, these are the product of uh, test of uh, adaptive landscapes uh, in skull shape in bats on these, uh, the PC, the significant PC axis. Mm -hmm. So we use uh, an algorithm called L1OU, which is relatively new. And what this model does, it's uh, modeling the uh, changing adaptive landscape or an austin uhlenberg process. That means it's testing to see if there is a, a significant parameter that indicates a selection towards different adaptive optima in the variable that we're uh, uh, run the analysis on, in this case, the skull shape variables. And uh, then we contrast that with other types of models like Brownian motion or um, uh, early burst, et cetera. So uh, the nice thing about these models is that it doesn't require an a priori number of adaptive shifts, uh, so we can let the data speak for itself. Uh, so we feed all of our PC score data uh, from the important significant principal components into these analysis. Uh, and we run this analysis in, in two ways. So we did ran them across the whole phylogeny of bats uh, with the sheehan robosky phylogeny, which was made here. And then we did uh, another analysis that was more focused uh, on a group of bats, uh, the phylostomates, using uh, phylogeny that included uh, some uh, additional species. All right. So how has skull morphology evolved in this radiation of bats? Um, so before I start answering this question, I'm going to show you um, what are the major morphological axes uh, that explain the variation of skull shape across bats, so the big bat morphospace. So here are, the, uh, here are some plots that show you the phylogenetic principal components uh, from those uh, geometric morphometric analysis, and we found that with uh, three principal components, we can explain about 70% of the variation in skull shape across bats, so we're going to focus our phylogenetic comparative analysis on those. So the first principal component uh, explains the degree of, of cranial elongation, but primarily rostral elongation. So on one extreme, you got species that have extremely elongated snouts, and then on the other extreme, you have extremely foreshortened snouts. I was talking with some people earlier today, and we all talked about these centuriocenex bats. Uh, so if you were in those conversations, this is where those guys are falling. And the second axis of variation has to do with the degree of cranial flexure. So in one extreme, we have species that tend to have uh, snouts that uh, are very dorsally oriented with respect to the brain case. And then on the other extreme, we have species that tend to have the rostrum is more pointed downwards. Now, in this plot, the uh, points are colored by uh, families, you can see here. Uh, and the only thing I'm going to point out with respect to that is that uh, there's one particular family, the phallostomids, which uh, basically span a broad uh, range of that morphospace, in particular in that first principal component. OK, and then the third axis of variation has to do with how tall or how flat the skulls are. So we have very flattened skulls and very tall skulls here. And again, the phallostomids here are in red, and as you can see, they also span a broad range of that morphospace. OK, so now I'm going to show you the results from this L1OU analysis uh, on the bat phylogeny, so how skull morphology has changed over the course of the evolution of bats. So there's a lot to take in here, so I'm going to walk you through um, this phylogeny and, and all the things that it has on top of it. So here's the bat phylogeny. <laughs> uh, each one of these are the different uh, bat families, uh, but don't worry about those for now. Uh, the asterisks represent uh, significant uh, shifts in the adaptive regime on skull morphology, so these are changes in the direction of skull shape evolution. Uh, and the bootstrap values are shown here. And then each one of the selective regimes is shown with a different color on the branches. The colors of the asterisks also have some information. So 
The blue ones represent transitions in echolocation. The red ones represent transitions in diet. The black ones represent transitions in neither of those. And the purple ones represent transitions in both. Okay, so there's a lot of information, I know. So I can give you a, a summary of what we are observing by saying that the majority of the shifts that we see early in the evolutionary history of bats from 58 to 34 million years ago uh, were primarily associated with transition and echolocation modes. Whereas the later shifts are primarily associated with transitions in diet. And those are primarily found, as you can see here, within this family of bats, the phylostomids. So now, uh, moving on, I'm going to show you uh, what these different uh, selected regimes look like and then what kind of other links we can establish with different behavior and ecology, ecological factors. Okay, so like I said, these early adaptive shifts seem to be primarily associated with transitions and echolocation type. So this is the same diagram, different adaptive regimes, a color in, dif with, uh, in different colors. Uh, but I'm adding here the principal component axis that I showed you earlier and the direction of the bars just represent the values for those different species. Uh, so that indicates kind of what their morphologies would look like. Okay, and then the asterisks also represent the significant transitions. Okay, so the first shift that we see up here leads to the pteropodid bats. So these bats are those bats that lost the ability to echolocate uh, for the most part. They are uh, primarily visual bats, and you can see that reflected very well in their skulls. They tend to have really lar uh, large eye orbits, and they tend to have these elongated skulls that are relatively flat. Now, something that is really interesting about pteropodids uh, that is really not shown in these analyses is the fact that these are also some of the largest bats that there exist in the world. Not all of them are that, are that big. This is like the largest uh, of all of them. But they do have a, a general trend in evolving uh, larger uh, body sizes in conjunction with this evolution of feeding on uh, plant uh, foods like flowers uh, and fruits. So recently, um, we, we published uh, a couple of articles where we were looking at um, how this evolution of uh, a larger body size and pteropodids and other parameters in other bats uh, might have created some constraints for their echolocation in their ancestors uh, and how that might explain the loss of echolocation in pteropodids. So I'm going to uh, explain that a little bit here in, in this slide to give you an idea of uh, how pteropodids might have gotten to have these skull shapes that they have today. So before I do that, I need to explain uh, something really basic uh, about uh, sound, which is that Across mammals, if we look at uh, animals with larger sizes, so larger body masses, the frequencies that they can emit, of sounds that they can emit, get slower. So larger mammals tend to emit lower frequency sounds than smaller mammals. And that is true across mammals, but that is also true within bats. So this is uh, a trend for vespertilonid bats, the evening bats, uh, where you also see that. Larger bats tend to emit lower echolocation call frequencies um, than smaller bats. Now, why does it matter? So, if you're a bat, the, your ability to detect uh, a prey item is very linked with your echolocation call frequency. So, high echolocation uh, call frequencies are good for detecting small insects, and the opposite is true to a certain extent. Right? So, if you want to be an insectivorous bat, uh, it's good to have high echolocation call frequencies, therefore, it's good to be small. But pteropodids then uh, did the opposite. These bats started getting larger as they were consuming more plant resources. So uh, what we pose in this paper is that that posed some constraints in their echolocation call systems, rendering sort of ineffective for finding uh, uh, insect prey items. But at the same time, as they were evolving larger sizes, their eyes were becoming proportionally larger too. And you can see there's a direct relationship between pteropodid uh, size and their eye size too, and uh, larger pteropodids have larger eyes. And this matters because in mammals, as eyes become larger, so uh, does uh, visual acuity also. So larger eyes have higher visual acuity. So there's this kind of uh, interesting potential trajectory that pteropodids had and where in that they were becoming larger, echolocation was becoming less effective, but vision might have become more effective than 
therefore then lose an echolocation. And that then might be tied to the evolution of these very particular skull morphologies with very large eye orbits. Okay, everybody with me? All right. Okay, so now we're gonna jump uh, to the echolocating bats. And the first group I wanna show you uh, are these nasal echolocating bats. So remember, they're producing sound through their nostrils. Um, and uh, there are several families here that kind of share similar morphologies, uh, skulls that are relatively um, elongated, uh, they are tall, and uh, they tend to have their snouts pointing downwards. And remember that kind of positions the nostrils more in the direction of the flight path of the bat. There's a lot of variation within these bats in the size of the nasal chambers, which uh, has been uh, correlated to some extent with differences in echolocation call parameters. So there's a lot of variation uh, within these families and among these families that might be also related to differences in echolocation ability and prey type. The nycterids are another family of bats uh, that are nasal echolocating bats, but you see there's a transition here to a different uh, selective regime, and you might see why their mor skull morphologies are really different from the ones that I showed you earlier. Uh, they are nasal echolocating bats, but they have this weird uh, nasal structure, and I'm told that when these bats are echolocating, they kind of uh, vibrate that structure as they're producing sound. And as you can see, the skulls have this this shape uh, kind of part that's given support to that very specialized structure. So there is something about, again, the echolocation system of these bats that are shaping their skull anatomy um, to, to a great extent. Okay, then we have a very eclectic group of bats, uh, the majority of bats, which are oral emitting animal eating bats. The majority of them are insectivorous. So you can see there are several families here. And their morphologies, uh, the general aspects of the morphology that they share is that they have relatively short skulls. Um, they have, uh, their snouts are relatively turned upward. And again, that has implications for echolocation call beam. And the, tend to be relatively flat, but there's it's a lot of variation there. Now, this is representative of different families within this group, and as you can see, there's also still a lot of variation that is not being captured uh, by this mapping that we're doing here, and it might be because we're uh, only using these three principal components for a phylogenetic comparative analysis. Um, if you have ever looked at a mammal skull, for example, you uh, might notice that there's a structure here that is called the sagittal crest that serves uh, for the insertion of the jaw muscles and that is very pronounced in this guy, meaning that they have bigger jaw muscles, potentially they could eat harder prey than these guys. So again, there's still a, some variation uh, that uh, in skull morphology that might be related to more finite dietary differences than what we're seeing here. Now, uh, while I'm talking about these families, I'm going to take a little detour um, of some really uh, interesting findings that we've had as we were exploring this uh, broad evolution of skull shaping bats, and that is within the family Vespertilionidae, the evening bats. And these guys have uh, naturally occurring clefts. So as you might know, cleft palates are deleterious in most species, but in Vespertilionids and in other groups of bats, naturally occurring clefts have evolved and are consistently found across the family. So this is a dorsal view of a skull and you can see some of them, they're really, really pronounced. And if we look at across the family, there are different degrees of palate clefting. So we have some species, which are shown mapped here in yellow, that have smaller clefts and they have species that are intermediate and species that have very pronounced cleft and that has evolved also several times within the family. Now, of course, as a functional morphologist, we see this, and the first question we want to ask is, okay, how is this, is this advantageous for these bats? And the question is that we don't know yet. Um, mm -hmm. It has been posed that it might allow more flexibility uh, of the snout, uh, of the soft tissues within the snout for echolocation, because they're all oral echolocators, um, or that it might increase the echolocation call beam, but that hasn't been tested. We were interested in understanding whether or not this affects uh, feeding um, function. So what's happening when a bat like this is biting versus a bat like this, or a bat that has a cleft versus a bat that doesn't have a cleft. So to test that, we build finite element models. So basically we take our 
micro CT scans of the skulls and we build uh, tetrahedral meshes, which is a fancier, fancier 3D mesh uh, that we can use for these type of analysis that are uh, similar to what engineers use to test if a bridge is going to break, if a plane is going to break, etc. Except that we do it in a bat skull. So we take these and we simulate different biting behaviors and it allows us to see how the forces in that skull are distributed. So we took a, a model of a natural cleft and then we took a model where we artificially filled that cleft and then we virtually made them bite and we s looked at how the forces are distributed. And what we found surprisingly is that these clefts uh, likely affect the feeding performance of these bats in that um, if you look at a metric of uh, how much energy um, is uh, concentrated in different parts of the skull or how much deformation uh, can happen in different parts of the skull, we find that the natural cleft model tends to be uh, more stressed or, or have more uh, higher levels of strain. It's a little hard to see with these plots here, but uh, it's easier to see it here. There's a greater number of elements. This is a number of elements uh, that have lower levels of stress. And we find similar uh, trends with strain too. So the clefts are not advantageous uh, for feeding, apparently. Uh, maybe they are advantageous for echolocation. And the reason why I wanted to show you these results is to show you how sometimes these functions might potentially be conflicting and evolving uh, in, in different ways, even within uh, groups that are relatively homogeneous with the same echolocation call type and the same type of diet. Okay, another interesting case within the Vespertilionids is the case of uh, Corinorhinus. Uh, which is a genus that is found here. As you can see, it has its own little shift and its own little uh, selective regime. And that was really cool to find because uh, these are considered oral echolocators, but there's some acoustic and behavioral evidence that they might use uh, nasal echolocation facultatively. And the skull shape that they have actually converges with this family of bats that are also nasal echolocators. So it's really cool to see how the morphology uh, within this broader group of oral echolocators might be converging with nasal echolocators. You, if you look at the picture of these bat too, you see they have like a little bit of like nasal elaborations that are characteristic of uh, nasal echolocating bats. So that was really neat that the, this type of morphological analysis kind of allows us to potentially tie it to behavioral um, data. Okay, we have a group of oral emitting animal eating bats that are separate from all the ones that I uh, told you earlier. These are the mopeds or the ghost bats. Again, they have their own uh, adaptive zone. And these guys are characterized by these extremely dorsally flexed snouts, um, as you can see here. Uh, we don't know what this does for the bats when they are echolocating. Um, these are the only bats that are uh, use constant frequencies when they are echolocating uh, within the oral echolocating bats. So, it's kind of hard, I mean, potentially it's amplifying the width of the beam, but we don't know. This would be a, an amazing project for a grad student who wants to test that and do some acoustic modeling um, or final element modeling. I'm really open to ideas as to how we can figure out how that works. Okay, and then lastly, but uh, most importantly within this phylogeny, we have this group of bats where we have all these recent adaptive uh, shifts, and that is the family Phallostomidae, the neotropical leaf nose bats. I'm going to zoom in this family with another phylogeny uh, that is a little bit more uh, complete uh, to show you then where those shifts are and what, that me what they might be related to. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of variation in skull morphology within this family. A lot of that variation has to do with the degree of cranial elongation. And when we map, um, so the branches are colored here for the selective regimes. Uh, and then you have boxes here uh, noting what are the diets of those different branches. And as you can see, uh, they almost perfectly match what these bats are eating. So the omnivorous, uh, insectivorous and omnivorous bats are kind of doing, doing their thing. Within the frugivorous phyllostomids, uh, we have a lot of them have converged into, uh, sorry, evolved into these morphologies that are relatively short-faced. And within this clade of uh, frugivorous phallostomids, we have even an increase in that shortening of the face and also additional shifts, which is crazy. So they're really exploding this hard fruit 
uh, niche to, to uh, a great extent and in different ways, potentially. Something that's really cool is that within this group, we have the evolution of nectarivory uh, twice. So there's one group and this group, and both of them converge to this elongated snouts, and that allows them to accommodate a long tongue that they can use for feeding. And then the vampire bats also have their own adaptive zone. Uh, they have these kind of surprisingly robust skulls for being a vampire bat, but they tend to have this elongated and uh, forwardly, forward projecti projected uh, incisors. OK, so this kind of confirms what we suspected for a while and what a lot of the literature in Phyllosomet is pointing towards, uh, which is that this is a, a dietary adaptive radiation. So there have been a lot of features that have evolved in tandem with diet and phyllostomids, and there's also one peak in the, the species diversification within this family, which is located in this uh, group of fruit-eating bats. So the features that have evolved along with diet and phyllostomids include all of these here. And if you were paying attention earlier, you would notice that I already mentioned a lot of these at the beginning of the talk, and that is because most of the studies connecting Skull morphology or cranial morphology with diet have been done in phallostomids because they're kind of like the low-hanging fruit. Uh, I think we all knew that uh, there's something interesting there. So uh, for this last part of the talk, I'm going to kind of walk you through and summarize what we know about the evolution of this ecological radiation of the phallostomids and how we have been able to piece together kind of the morphology, the performance, and behavior uh, into a kind of an overall picture of uh, adaptive evolution. So we have found that cranial morphology and biomechanics evolve under selection for diet and feeding behavior in phallostomids. So as I was showing you earlier in those plots, there's a, a trend within phallostomids uh, in terms of the degree of skull elongation from species that have relatively elongated snouts to species that have very shortened snouts. So, on one extreme, uh, in addition to having that degree of skull elongation, we have other kind of mechanical uh, parameters that uh, also derive from that, uh, that we have tested both through biomechanical models and also through behavioral experiments. So these guys tend to have, again, these flat, long, and narrow skulls. These uh, parameters result in a low mechanical advantage of that uh, whole system. So that means that the ability of this skull shape um, to translate muscle force into bite force is low. So they produce low bite forces for their size. They tend to uh, have a higher investment in the masseter muscle, so this muscle here, the muscle that we have in our cheeks, to produce bite force. And that has some other me mechanical consequences, which means that these bats can maintain bite forces at wider gapes because the masseter is a little better at resisting stretching uh, and therefore contracting after it has been stretched. Uh, also, this uh, kind of maintenance of uh, by force at wide gapes has to do uh, with the elongation of the rostrum. So, based on that, we can then make some predictions about the diets of these bats, and, and we can confirm those predictions by going to the field and, and quantifying their diets. And we have done a little bit of that, but it's still a lot of work that needs to be done on the basic ecology of these bats. Uh, but we would predict that these bats would be feeding either on liquid diets or on uh, soft prey items, soft insects, soft fruits, uh, although they could feed in relatively larger fruits or insects as long as they are soft. Now conversely, we have these very tall, short, and um, broad skulls with high mechanical advantage, again, so kind of built to, to bite hard, so these bats are producing high bite forces for their size. They tend to invest more in the temporalis muscle, this muscle here, for the production of bite force. But that means that the bite force drops at white gapes because the stretching of that muscle kind of uh, drives that, that trade-off in this case, and also because they have you know, shorter snouts. And ecologically then, what that means is that these bats will be feeding on relatively tough diets. Uh, so hard fruits, although they, they tend to be they would have to be relatively small, or they have to bite them with behaviors that require uh, uh, low gape as well. And uh, for a long time, 
For example, the more extreme species, we didn't know what the more extreme species within this group ate, the wrinkle face bats, and it has been recently discovered that they're actually eating the seeds of, uh, of fruit, so they're, and they're eating them with behaviors that allows them to use a low gape, so that fits kind of our predictions for this, the very extreme morphologies in this gradient. Okay, so that takes me to my next point, which is the behavior. How are they using these morphologies, and then how are they kind of dealing with these potential trade-offs, mechanical trade-offs that result from their morphologies? So what we found through behavioral experiments in the field, we take the bats and we feed them different kinds of foods, hard foods, soft foods, and we find that these guys tend to use a, a greater amount of bilateral bites, meaning that they bite in their foods like you would bite a hamburger. And these guys are using more unilateral bites, so they tend to bite more with one side of their mandible. And I'm going to show you a video here that I hope it plays. Let's see. Oh, some of those unilateral bites. That's my hand. They're great. <laughs> and you will see that you know, the last bite I'll take is very clear. You just bite with one side of their mouth. All right, and what's really amazing, to me anyway, is um, how stereotyped some of these behaviors can be. So we've observed uh, how these bats are feeding, again, in different kinds of foods. Uh, this is just for, on average, for one kind of food. And if you look at some of the uh, more specialized species within this uh, gradient, for example, for elongation, uh, glossophaga and carolia, uh, or for the other extreme uh, centurion and spheronicterus, they, they present a much greater use of these bites, even when we switch their food type. So this is a degree of their behavioral plasticity when we feed them different kinds of foods, hard versus soft. And you can see these guys tend to have a lower behavioral plasticity, meaning that they're using those bite types regardless of what kind of food they're eating, and same thing for these guys. So it's very, very stereotyped. So then to close kind of the loop between the behavior and the morphology, I'm going to show you what these bites do to the morphology. So again, we built these finite element models of the skulls of bats uh, in a similar way that I described earlier. And then we've simulated um, the unilateral bites or the bilateral bites um, across different morphologies of species that have these kind of more elongated snouts and the shortened snouts. And what we found is that just by virtue of their shape alone, these morphologies are more resistant to this unilateral biting behaviors. So they have evolved not only this high capacity to produce high bite forces, but at the same time, these morphologies are resistant to the behaviors that can produce these bite forces. So that kind of closes the loop on that kind of ecomorphological paradigm. Okay, the last thing I'm going to show you uh, has to do with the soft tissue. So a lot of the work that we do in my lab is on bones, but we're becoming more and more interested on, on soft tissues and, and ways to um, study them non-destructively. So recently we've been kind of uh, engaging in, in this new revolution of iodine staining of specimens uh, to quantify, to image them and quantify them through micro CT scanning. So this is a result of a lot of work on different bat species where we stain those muscles and then we uh, reconstruct them digitally. And the really cool thing about that is that it allows us to see kind of the, the general variation across species without having to dissect the specimens, both kind of externally, but also internally. And that is something that uh, now is, is really uh, becoming uh, kind of a, a major feature of interest within our research because we're finding that, for example, muscles like the masseter uh, have different subdivisions across bats uh, from different species or that are feeding on different diets. And this could also represent different kinds of adaptations in the soft tissue that uh, we haven't explored before and might have some functional repercussions too. So in a few years from now, I hope to have Similar analysis that I presented today, but in the soft tissue morphology, and I'm sure that's going to be a really interesting picture. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, bat skull shape has evolved uh, under multiple selective regimes that match ecology and behavior. So early in the evolutionary history of bats, we see that a lot of those major divergences have to do with echolocation types. 
And later, uh, we see that they might be associated with diet hardness and feeding behavior within the phylosomid bats. This was a very surprising result to me. Uh, most of my career, I've been interested in evolution in relation to diet. So to see that echolocation is playing such a significant role has been uh, really eye-opening and opening a lot of also research directions. So in big summary, it's a combination of these sensory and prey processing functions that shape the diversity of cranial morphologies in bats. And this really, uh, it's a call to, to all of us to really think about the multifunctionality of structures that we are studying. Uh, often we, we have to focus on one particular function. Uh, we can't study everything, but it's good to kind of build upon that and really understand how multiple functions might be shaping morphological diversity. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank uh, funding sources, all the museums um, that uh, lent us specimens, field stations for conducting our field work, and then all of our people in my lab. And uh, this is currently not working, but we'll have it working um, soon again. Uh, we have a, a tool where you can, uh, an augmented reality tool, uh, that you can download an app in your phone, scan this little kind of baseball-like cart, and then you can look at the bat skulls in the palm of your hand. So stay tuned, we'll have that back soon. All right, and with that, I'll take any questions. Any questions? I'll start here. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the ball. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, so uh, thinking about echolocation mm -hmm. um, and all those amazing skull shapes, are there any modifications of the skull that have to do with receiving the signal, mm. not just pr producing the signal? I'm absolutely. wondering about that. Yeah, absolutely. There are, there are some big differences between, for example, bats uh, in the shape of the uh, optic ca uh, yes, capsule, the, the ear capsule, uh, between bats that are for example, constant frequency echolocators and frequency modulator echolocators. The semicircular canals are also, there's a lot of diversity. So there are people who are actively working on that uh, with CT scans. So we're not touching that part uh, because there are other groups working on it. And it's a, it's a low hanging fruit too because uh, they're very dense. So they, they show really well in CT scans. So you can do a lot of comparisons. Yeah, yeah. And similarly, uh, if you look at the non-echolocating bats, also their ear morphology looks different. Mm -hmm. Great question, yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, um, so I'm wondering, uh, because in primates and carnivores, we have uh, brain size and some sort of skull dimensions related mm -hmm. to social behavior. I was wondering if you'd looked into that at all, and certainly bats, some of them are flying in flocks and some aren't. So. Yeah, that's a great question. So not yet. So this, this is kind of like hot off the press. We just, we have this big data set and um, we're kind of now, we have the big patterns and we're kind of like parsing it out. Um, we reran the test that I showed uh, today also uh, by actually classifying species by echolocation type and by diet type, and we find that, that it, the same support. So we think that these broad patterns are consistent with, with those uh, main uh, history, life history traits and, and ecological traits. It would be really interesting to test that, I think, like within uh, some families of bats. The tricky part is getting the social information because we have very limited information in terms of what the social group size is for most bat species. Like we have, there's data, there are data on bat colony size, but that doesn't represent the social group with which they're interacting. And there's also a lot of information that's missing in terms of how they're foraging. Uh, if they're foraging in groups, and uh, so there's still a lot that we need uh, to learn about that. But that's an excellent question and something that we could definitely test with this if we had the behavioral information. Mm -hmm. I'll get to throw it too far. <laughs> right, I, have, I have one question. <laughs> Sounds good. In the, the radiation that happened that looks like, in the really dramatic radiation that you showed. The phallus summits. Yeah, mm -hmm. is there any biology of the bats that you can point to that kind of predicts that particular radiation or ecology or well, so the Yeah, yeah. So the, the paper where we um, and it looked at that spike in, in species diversification, we also reconstructed the degree of um, plant consumption. Um, and so it's the primarily, it appears to be driven by transitions toward primary forgivery. 
and not just that, but also fruits that are hard. So apparently this was a, a gynecological opportunity for these bats, like, and whatever they were um, evolving, those hard fruits were not being consumed by other nocturnal mammals, so there was an, an ecological opportunity that allows them to radiate. And, uh, and that was facilitated by the evolution of these shorter or shorter uh, skulls. Mm -hmm. Is that what can you ask? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up to that, um, I wonder if, now of course this is out of your domain, but I know there is a record of the tree composition of tropical forests, oh, neotropical uh -huh. forests mm -hmm. that goes back 60 million years, mm -hmm. and I wonder if you would be able to look at, be you know, the distribution and radiation of some of the genera or th uh, of these groups that are, that, are, that are producing these fruits to see if there's any relationship. That would be fantastic. I would love to collaborate with any plant biologist, evolutionary biologist uh, on that, I think. Yeah, great, great. Yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Let's thank Shailene one more time. Thank you, guys. <laughs>